All right, welcome everybody to today's virtual crop talk and hopefully everybody's enjoying the nice uh, temperatures uh, this week, especially after the last previous two weeks that we had. And this week's uh, virtual crop talks are aptly timed, especially today, you know, get guys thinking about uh, weed control options and grain sorghum. And why isn't it advancing? I'll tell you guys, when we uh, get started on some of these things, it always seems like it works really good until we are live in front of everyone. So hang with us just a second here. There we go. <laughs> All right, like I said, these crop talks are brought to you by a group of agents. Uh, definitely it took everybody on uh, planning this, as you see all who's involved. Uh, most of these are uh, might be some of your local uh, agents. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out to any of us. Like I said, I'm Craig Dinkle from the Midway Extension District, the crop production agent. And just to go over some housekeeping uh, things, uh, if you're on Zoom and you have a question for the speaker, please put it here in the Q&A box. You can see that down at the bottom. Uh, any type of uh, technical issues or if you're having any problems with Zoom or uh, can't see the slides or something like that, uh, put them in the chat box and somebody will help you uh, try to resolve that. And if you're on YouTube live, uh, you can type your questions into, into the comment box, but you will have to have a, a cr account created uh, to be able to type in your question in the YouTube live. Or you can also email Jeannie Falk Jones with your questions at jfalkjones at ksu.edu. Then one thing we'll be using is this uh, poll everywhere. Uh, it's kind of an interactive deal. So one way to use poll everywhere is put in pollev.com slash ksu into a web browser on your computer or you can use your phone, uh, you'll text 2233 here. And then in the message part, uh, put KSU. So that's text 22333. And then in the message area, KSU is how to access and use poll everywhere on your phone. Whoop. Oh, there we go. And just to do an example poll, uh, what was your high temperature yesterday? One of the really th cool things about Poll Everywhere is that we get automatic responses from you guys. So we can see exactly as you're voting. And so that really kind of helps our, present our presenters as we're going forward on some of the discussion and things along those lines. So we really appreciate you guys um, responding back with the Poll Everywhere. If for some reason you're having questions or issues, go ahead and put it in the chat box and we'll see if we can get it figured out. For some reason yesterday, we were having a little bit of issues with it on the Sunflower webinar, but hopefully today it's, <laughs> we've got all the bugs worked out of it and it's back working again here. All right, looks like a lot of people were in the 60 to 69 degree range. Uh, so yeah, definitely a big switch from the previous week. <laughs> A few in the low 40s. All right, and if you're here for CCA credits, uh, there's two ways that we'll be able to get those uh, documented for you. You can email uh, Jeannie at jfolkjones at ksu.edu at the beginning and, and then again at the end of the webinar with your name and CCA number, or we'll have a QR code uh, here at the end of the webinar, we'll put up and that if you have that app or uh, ability to do that on your phone, uh, we'll have that QR code up at the end of the webinar. And now to introduce our speaker for today is uh, Dr. Sarah Lancaster. Uh, she is a 
K-State Research and Extension Weed Specialist. Uh, she is based out of the Manhattan campus, but she covers the whole in, entire state of Kansas and definitely uh, will be getting out and about here probably pretty soon to explore the whole state as far as what type of weed issues we have in this uh, very uh, different uh, geographies of Kansas. So definitely looking forward to having her around and uh, see the information she puts out for the state of Kansas to help everybody. All right, that should be up to you next, Sarah. All right, is it my turn? Yep. Oh, I jumped the gun on the screen share. Now I have to start over. All right, can you guys see my slides okay? It should be my title slide. Does that look good, Craig, Jeannie? Yep. Yes, it okay. looks good. And you guys can hear okay? Sound is good, good today? Yes. All right, just got to do those checks. So yeah, hey, thanks guys. I want to uh, start out thanking you all for your early participation in that poll everywhere kind of practice run. Um, I miss seeing humans in person. And so, you know, this is a, a poor substitute, but it's the best we've got. So um, I've got about three different slides in here that we'll, we'll look for some participation from you guys on. So uh, Craig asked me to talk about weed control, weed management um, in grain sorghum. So um, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out as the market settle and adjust, but I think a lot of folks are anticipating an increase in grain sorghum acreage this summer. And so we're going to hopefully address some of the kind of basics of uh, weed management and grain sorghum today. So as far as basics of weed control, the number one first step in any weed management system is to know your weeds. So I um, put this slide together based on conversations with weed scientists and agronomists and farmers, and also a little bit of survey data for the from states in the Great Plains region. So uh, the key weed species um, to think about in grain sorghum. Um, statewide, you know, I just did an interview earlier this morning and we were talking about statewide weed problems. This character here on the far left of your screen, uh, definitely you, if you guys are uh, growing anything, you know that this is our number one weed problem statewide is Palmer amaranth. Um, another uh, key group of plants to think about as we're growing grain sorghum would be the sorghums, the weedy sorghums. So this is a photo of shatter cane, but Johnson grass um, actually probably is more problematic in a lot of cases than shatter cane simply because shatter cane is an annual weed. Johnson grass is a perennial weed, so it's just more difficult to manage and get rid of. Um, some other things to think about would be morning glories, that large hard seed, it can emerge from deep in the soil. So a lot of times our pre's kind of run out or, or miss uh, morning glory more so than smaller seeded weeds like uh, Palmer amaranth. And then there are also other grass species that are problematic. I, I pulled a picture of large crabgrass. That would be one. Uh, we'll look at some data on foxtail species. I know sandbur is one that I get questions about a lot. Um, unfortunately, haven't had a good opportunity to, to look at that in the field. So, you know, if you guys have a good spot, uh, I'll give you my contact information at the end of the presentation. So just some key weed species to think about as we uh, as we move ahead here. So here is my first question. To what extent have limited herbicide options led you as a farmer to avoid growing grain sorghum? So I've got three choices here. A, a lot, B, somewhat or occasionally, and C, not at all. So Let's see here. I think I need to switch this to that view. That looks better. Okay. I'll give it a few more seconds. I think our friends who are watching on YouTube maybe have a little bit of a delay um, in what they're seeing. So they may want to uh, answer I caught up to us. So we'll give it just a few more seconds here. So it looks like right now uh, the majority is somewhat or occasionally and with about half of the respondents and then 
almost an even split between a lot or not at all. So, you know, honestly, this is kind of the answers I was thinking I'd probably see here with this. You know, we do have a lot fewer options for weed management in grain sorghum compared to other things, um, for example, corn. Okay. So when we think about weed management in grain sorghum, you know, just going back to those basics is, is super important, right? We started with the very most basic principle of knowing your weeds and knowing your weed species so that you can select appropriate control measures. But one of the other things to really think about here is we think about grain sorghum. Um, I've got two points on this slide. The first is to use integrated management practices. Um, as I think about that, I think particularly about cultural practices. You know, we mentioned that for grain sorghum that shatter cane and Johnson grass are two of the most difficult weeds to control just because they're so closely related to grain sorghum. Um, they're the same genus and in some cases the same species even. So um, uh, at the cultural practice of crop rotation is actually one of the best ways to manage for those grassy weeds and especially for Johnson grass and shatter cane. Uh, we're going to talk about the new technologies at the end of the, the slideshow today. And I just want to point out that on those new technologies, guys, actually Johnson grass and shatter cane are not listed as controlled species on the labels. So just something to think about the role of crop rotation. If you're in a spot, if you've got a field where um, you know that Johnson grass or shatter cane is a problem, that's not the place to go to grain sorghum um, for sure. The other point that I want to make on this slide is the importance of timely applications. So we're going to look at sort of, you know, step by step uh, pre's, posts um, for grain sorghum, but especially with those post emergent products, being timely is super important. Um, you know, the, the most common call that I get as far as sorghum weed management is managing Palmer amaranth post. Um, you know, two things to say about that, and we're going to hit on this again later in the presentation. Number one, you've got to have a pre down the best time to control any weed, but especially our pig weeds is before you ever even see it. Um, and then being timely with those post emergent applications. Uh, well, look, we do have some products that are labeled for Palmer amaranth control and sorghum, but guys, that depends on getting those Palmer when they're small. So we'll look at that in some more detail as we move through the slideshow. One other consideration for you guys that are, are maybe expanding your sorghum acres or, or new to sorghum um, would be to think about the potential for carryover. So in a lot of locations across the state, we've had a rainfall pattern um, over the last year or, or the, over the last, I'm sorry, six months or so that looks like this. So um, on this chart, we pulled a daily rainfall off of Mesonet and then we showed the rainfall accumulation uh, you might notice there are some large flat steps here as we went through the end of the summer and into the winter. The blue line on this chart shows normal or expected rainfall, okay? When we talk about herbicide degradation, rainfall and soil moisture to keep the soil microorganisms working on those herbicides is super important. So when we have annual rainfall that is this far behind what we would normally expect, we have an increased potential for carryover. So again, as you're thinking about placing sorghum acres this year, think about what you used on your corn and what you used on your soybeans if they were in those fields last year, and just be aware of the potential for carryover. Um, I pulled these data from Belleville. Other parts of the state are this, this uh, extreme. Some parts of the state are not this extreme. So pull your weather um, look, and look at, or you, you know, think about what you've seen here this fall and winter, okay? So potential for carryover. All right, the title that uh, we worked up for this talk was Start Clean, Stay Clean. So let's think about starting clean, okay? Burn down programs are critical um, or tillage passes, right? You've got to have that clean foundation. An artist is gonna start with a clean canvas. A, a crop producer needs to start with a clean seed bed. Um, I did not choose, I chose not to go into detail on burn down programs um, in this particular slide set. The key to burn down programs, guys, is cheap. You need to get rid of what's out there so that your pre's have a chance to work when it's time to use them. You don't want your pre's to have to fight through a mat of, you know, henbit, chickweed, uh, cheat, downy brome, whatever you've got out there, your winter annuals, you want them controlled. 
Uh, kosha would be another one, right? Like now is the ideal time to be thinking uh, burn down with some residual uh, herbicide for kosher control. Okay, so burn down programs so that our pre's um, have a chance to work. That's going to be very important. When we think about our pre-emergent programs, a lot of our programs are built kind of on a formula uh, that contains these three bullet points. So some level of atrazine, often a group 15 herbicide. So that would be things like dual or outlook um, could, to go down pre for controlling grasses. And they're gonna do a pretty good job on uh, pigweed. They're not gonna be perfect, uh, but they're gonna help, okay? And then the other uh, piece that we often see here pre is, is Callisto. So a group 27 herbicide. And then we wanna see a little atrazine with that just to, to kind of bump up the control we get a little bit. Okay, and so with this guys, again, thinking about our target of grasses, which your group 15s are gonna do a decent job with and small seeded broadleaves, namely Palmer amaranth. If we think Palmer amaranth, theoretically uh, resistance issues notwithstanding, we've got three herbicide modes of action um, here. So this is not a, these data that I put on the slide, not from a huge data set, just four reps of a couple of treatments that we put out here in Manhattan last summer. Um, but just looking at metolachlor plus atrazine, metolachlor plus meso plus atrazine, both gave us really great control. Now the caveat to all of this with pre-emergent products is rainfall, right? Here in Manhattan last spring, we had ideal conditions for getting these herbicides activated um, in our pre-emergent products. So then the next question you ask, well, if I'm not going to get good activation, what's the point? The point is you're still going to get some activity relative to what you would have if you had nothing out there at all. And when we're talking about Palmer amaranth that's producing literally millions of seed per acre, uh, when we have escapes, that little, that incremental control can add up. We have to think about um, incremental additions in, in our, our control. So um, these pre's have a role, okay? Um, just wanted to touch on that issue of activation a little bit more here. Um, some of our common pre-emergent herbicides that we might use um, in grain sorghum and looking at what the labels say in terms of activation. Um, so, you know, atrazine doesn't mention a specific rainfall amount. Um, Outlook just comments on the need for rainfall for activation. Um, Callisto only requires a quarter of an inch. And here's the big question that I often get, and I'm just going to be real honest, guys. I don't have enough data and enough uh, boots in the field time here in Kansas yet to give you guys a solid answer on this, because folks will argue this tooth and nail. Like it's almost as, as contentious as talking about red tractors versus green tractors. Uh, which is better, dual or, or harness? And so if you read the labels, harness says that it takes a little less rainfall for activation compared to dual. So maybe that's an advantage. Now, how, how does that interplay with timing of precipitation? How does that interplay with uh, residue on the surface of the soil? How does that interact with soil texture? We just don't have the data uh, readily available to look at that. So um, this is something that um, I'm hoping, it's an old question, right? These are old products, but man, we are, we are leaning on these products big time. So we need to make sure that we know how to best utilize them. And so that's something that we're hoping to dig into here as we move into 2021 uh, field research season. All right, so the second half of the title for this talk was stay clean. All right, so this literally guys is a list of the um, options from the weed control guide that have some level of activity on pigweed and um, are also labeled for post-emergent control, okay? So, you know, we've got things like 2,4-D, dicamba, right? We know that those are old products. Um, they are reasonably effective on reasonably sized uh, pigweeds. But, you know, with those two, we have a little bit of a risk of crop injury. So you've got to be willing to tolerate that. Uh, coming back in a lot of places with, you know, additional atrazine, again, as long as you're staying under that kind of environmental threshold that we have set on the label uh, for your particular soil um, in your field, that's, that's always a good idea, especially if you're going to go with something like a husky, 
right? So Husky is a group 27 herbicide, similar to mesotrione. It's going to benefit from that additional atrazine if you go out with Husky plus atrazine. Um, some of these products have, uh, actually most of these, all of these products have restrictions in terms of when they can be applied and, and to sorghum. So, you know, a lot of common things in here would be for atrazine less than 12 inches, uh, V7 uh, to V8 for uh, starring next husky has a, a label for three leaves to 30 inches. So that's a fairly wide, uh, wide range there. Okay, so reading your label, taking a look at your label, uh, super important. If you have the ability, you can extend some of those application windows by using drop nozzles, always something to think about. Um, especially as we get into to situations where, you know, we're looking at maybe avoiding a total, um, I'm going to use a real technical term here, a total train wreck um, in terms of Palmer amaranth control. So, you know, coming in later and, and getting those pigweeds that are, you know, four inches um, instead of letting them go and then you have, have nothing. Um, the other thing that I put on this slide in this list, guys, um, the group 15 herbicides. So we talk a lot about the importance of layered residuals or overlapping residuals. And so just, again, the best time to control a weed, especially Palmer, is before you ever see it. So, you know, if we can get to the right price point on um, some of these active ingredients, it can make some sense to think about putting those into your post-emergent applications. So here's my next question. Give you guys a minute to kind of process and think um, and give me some feedback here. What herbicides are you planning for your grain sorghum acres in 2021? So this is a different type of question. This question is a, a short answer. So uh, just send me a text message uh, with the names of the herbicides that you're using. So. Good, it looks like some folks are choosing to use the chat box. That's perfect. That's perfect. And we'll give a few more minutes just in case someone from uh, the YouTube stream wants to, to check in. I'm not sure how many we've got on there today. Outlook, a couple of full times, degree extra, atolachlor, bicep, atrazine, meso, starine. Good. Okay, looks like it's kind of settling down a little bit. Thanks guys, that helps. And it looks like, you know, from the, the products that I'm seeing here that kind of that that base blend for our, our pre's is super important. We've got Callisto, um, full-time, degree. Um, so Outlook, Dual, Cinch. Okay, those group 15s and then a, a group 27 and Atrazine. So excellent. All right. Okay, so let's talk, there's been some questions and some conversation around herbicide resistant grain sorghum. Um, so I just wanna touch on that today because it's gonna impact management decisions. Um, some folks I think maybe um, are looking for a silver bullet in grain sorghum production. You know, we kind of considered the Roundup Ready technology to be as, it's as close as we're gonna to get to a silver bullet in soybean and corn production. Um, spoiler alert guys, these are not, going to be silver bullets. You're going to need to position them carefully um, and consider integrated management practices. If you have some specific problems that you're looking at trying to address, these could be great resources or great tools to have in your toolbox. But don't, don't uh, kind of apply a, a one uh, herbicide resistant trait fits all acres approach here. So the three traits, we've got Enzyme, eye growth, and double team. So Enzyme is the Corteva product. The herbicide labeled for Enzyme use is going to be Zest, which is the same thing as Accent. Um, it's a post-emergent product. 
eye growth. Um, this is the one that kind of caused the splash this summer. Um, it is resistant to a herbicide called a Mazamox, which you guys might know as Raptor or Beyond. One of the unique things about eye growth is that it has, um, an Imiflex will have a pre and post emergent label. You'll only be able to use it one of those two times, but you'll have some flexibility as to when you use it. The third, um, the third technology here is double team. Um, this is the, the only one that's not gonna be commercially available this summer. And it's also different in that uh, Nicosulfuron and Amazamox are both ALS inhibiting herbicides. First Act or Quizalifop is an ACCase inhibiting herbicide. So ACCase inhibiting herbicides only control grasses. They only have post-emergent activity on grasses. So the, the trade name you're gonna be looking for is First Act, uh, same product um, as Assure, Assure 2, okay? So some of you guys will have some experience with this product um, in your location. So they're looking for a pilot launch in 2021. So they're trying, they're being very particular about where they're positioning this product and who they're working with because it doesn't have all of the export approvals that it needs yet. So it cannot go into commercial, uh, commercial chains. So very careful about where they're positioning, positioning it, but they are looking at getting some field data uh, this summer. And I'll tell you that I, I do believe we'll get to look at first act here um, in Manhattan in some tank mix situations. So I'm excited about that opportunity so I can have some data to share with y'all um, next summer. Speaking of data in these systems. So these data um, were not collected by me. Um, they were part of some trials that were funded by the sorghum checkoff program. Um, they were conducted these particular trials were conducted all across the sorghum growing region of the state of the country, but we're going to look at data from Hayes and Garden City. Um, these trials were conducted in fallow fields. So in this case, the weeds had every advantage. There was none of that crop competition there um, to uh, help to suppress those weeds at all. So all control is from these herbicides. They had pre-application timings to compare Imiflex to the group 15 herbicides that we've talked about, kind of the standards for grass control. And then they had two post timings. They had an early post and a late post timing of Imiflex, Zest, and they used a shore for the Quizalifot formulation there. Um, two different rates for each product. And again, two growth stages there. So jumping into the data here, these next few slides are all going to be the same. We've got our percent control here on the x-axis and then our herbicide treatment. I'm sorry, the y-axis, the vertical axis, and then our herbicide treatments are here along the x-axis. Okay, so Dr. Kumar collected these data about 30, 50, and 77 days after treatment um, of those, those pre-emergent applications. So the thing that should stand, that I hope stands out to you guys um, on this graph is that we really did get better control of the green foxtail with the Imiflex formulations here, okay? Uh, we got decent control with the, the group 15 products. It kind of wore out as we moved into that 70 day after application rating timing, but the Imiflex uh, looked like it was gonna, um, it was doing a little bit better, okay? Here's a photo just to give you an idea of the green foxtail pressure at that location. This plot would have been the, the middle rating for the high rate of Imiflex. Okay, so you can see what that looked like. We also have some large crabgrass data from Garden City. Um, little less weed pressure here. Um, Pat and Randall um, collected these data. So we had pretty good, really pretty good uh, control across the board here um, as far as our pre-emergent control. Okay. Um, some photos just to give you an idea. Um, you can see the, the polymer there, um, but not much crabgrass pressure, okay? All right, moving back to Hayes to look at some post-application data. Um, the thing that I want to have stick out in this graph, to you guys from this graph, the highest control was this high rate of Quizalifop or high rate of Ashore, okay? So as far as considering these post-emergent products on green foxtail, in this particular location, the Ashore did quite well. Um, and again, some photos just to give you guys an idea of what that looked like. So Imiflex applied post, Quizalifop applied post, and Zest applied post. So you can see 
Quizalifob didn't touch the puncture vine that was there, um, but it did do a good job on the foxtail. Sarah, did, uh, just real quick, did any of those post chemicals contain 2,4-D, you know? No, none of these did, none of these did. So these were simply looking at those, those three products um, to see what they're gonna get us for grass control. So yeah, good question, thanks. Good question. And so yeah, these studies here too, I see the other part of that question now in the chat box. Um, these studies didn't have any sorghum growing in them. This summer, we're gonna look at Manhattan and Hayes and Garden um, at these products in sorghum now that we've got varieties to release and we're moving closer um, to full launches for um, the double team. So we'll have some of that data this summer for you guys to look at. Good questions. All right. Uh, large crabgrass control, early post, Garden City. Um, again, pretty good control across the board. Um, high levels of control, um, yeah, with everything here, okay? Now, late post. You know, we talked about the importance of timeliness, guys, for pigweed, but timeliness matters for grasses too. You know, there's a reason that the companies put those heights on the, the labels, it's because that's where they feel comfortable standing behind their product. And so you can see none of these products did very well on green foxtail when it was applied late. So late being like 12 inch foxtail. Um, and then the, the late post application for Garden City, we start to see a little bit of separation here again with that high rate of quizalifop um, having a little bit better control than some of the other treatments. But again, generally poorer control and not, not as much separation here in the Garden City location. So we talked about crop rotation restrictions going, considerations going into sorghum earlier when we talked about carryover. Um, let's look at some of the rotational restrictions for these three products. They're a little bit uh, different than some of, of the other things we might, might have. So Zest and Emiflex being ALS inhibiting products, they have a much longer half-life um, and they affect a wider range of crops than Quizalifop. So zest here, um, no restriction to corn. Uh, Accent is labeled in corn, so no restriction there. Um, but we have all the way up to 18 months um, to go back to, canola, back to other grain sorghum varieties, um, to canola or to sunflower. Now, part of this rotation restriction with these other sorghum varieties is herbicide-resistant weed management um, strategies on the part of the companies. Okay, so um, there is some of that there um, in included in that 18 months restriction. Um, the other thing to look at here, Quizalifop, if you're thinking about going to other grass crops, they do put a 120 day rotational interview interval on those labels. And so, you know, that that holds true for for uh, first act, which is what we're looking at here, or whether you're talking about a shore or select for, let's say you've used that for volunteer corn control in your soybeans. Um, all of those labels have a, a bit of a rotation restriction. Um, some of the exceptions here would be if you have herbicide resistant varieties available um, to use, you can shorten those rotational intervals for um, Emiflex. And if you're thinking about going to corn, um, after a failed uh, sorghum for quizalifop. So last item here, we touched on the fact that those long rotation intervals going back to sorghum have to do with product stewardship and managing for herbicide resistance. So things to think about here, um, we really need to take good care with these, these technologies guys because we don't have a lot of options in grain sorghum and we have very closely related weedy relatives. So some things to think about, um, just general practices that slow the development of herbicide resistant weeds, limiting the number of applications. Um, and those also other practices of using multiple effective sites of action. Um, you can see the next bullet point there, don't plant sorghum in the same field in two, two consecutive years. And then don't position this, these products to fail. Don't use Enzyn or iGrowth sorghum where you know you have ALS resistant weeds, particularly Shattercane or Johnson grass. And then the next uh, step here is to avoid outcrossing to shatter cane or Johnson grass. You know, this doesn't occur with every, you know, pollen grain or every flower 
uh, that is produced, but it does occur. It is a very real possibility. Okay, so making sure that you don't have Johnson grass and shatter cane in or around your fields that are flowering at the same time as your sorghum, grain sorghum crop is going to be really important here um, in terms of preserving the, the, the life of this technology. Um, and just a few slides, these data um, are from 2016. Rodrigo is actually my counterpart at the University of Wisconsin now. Um, but they looked and they did find some populations of shatter cane throughout um, Nebraska, uh, right down here on the Kansas border that did exhibit resistance to ALS inhibiting herbicides. So it is out there. Um, and same thing for Johnson grass. We had a population of Johnson grass that was collected um, here in North, Northeast Kansas um, that was resistant to ALS inhibiting herbicides. So it's very real thing, something to be aware of. Here's my last poll question. What do you guys think? Which herbicide resistant grain sorghum trait are you most interested in? Incident, Emiflex, Double Team, or none of them? And if you guys have questions, I'm great with, you know, if you want to throw things into the chat box as we're we're waiting on the polls, we can do some of that too. I'm seeing a couple of other D answers coming into the chat box here. Okay, so we're looking at Emiflex, uh, followed by none, and then followed by double team. Okay, thanks guys for sharing that with me. That helps me know um, kind of how to look ahead and kind of what to expect for this summer. So someone says I'm um, Emiflex because I already bought the seed. They're, they're committed. All right, we will wrap this up here. So maybe, there we go. The last thing I wanted to share with you guys is just a reminder, you know, atrazine is super important for Kansas uh, crop production and grain sorghum and corn and fallow systems. Atrazine gets a lot of scrutiny from folks that are not in agriculture and all of that gets filtered through the EPA and all of that affects our ability to use these products. Atrazine is currently in the midst of a comment period, particularly related to this endangered species um, assessment here. Okay, so the folks that are anti-atrazine guys, I'm just going to be real, they're pretty good at rallying the troops and just getting large numbers of like carbon copied negative statements submitted to the EPA. Farmers are not so good at outspoke, being outspoken and sitting behind the computer and taking the time to explain to the EPA how they use it, what it means to them, and how they use it wisely. Okay, um, we know how to use this product wisely. We need to demonstrate and, and verbalize that to the, the decision makers, okay? So all of that kind of speech there would be to say that consider sitting down and, and giving some comments to the EPA um, in terms of this endangered species assessment. That being said, they have released an interim decision um, on the label review and I, we're going to see a lot more of this going forward, guys, not just on atrazine, but on other product labels as well. And that is label restrictions designed to reduce off target movement and keep those products in place. Um, you know, really, it's all couched under protecting endangered species, um, but it's, it's going to affect the label restrictions that we have, particularly in terms of things like droplet size. Right. We know that larger droplets don't move as far um, and paying attention to wind speed. So I know that Jeannie had a, a picture of the weed control guide scrolling through the slides before we started the presentation, but I just want to remind you guys that you can uh, visit any of the agents that are participating in this uh, series of discussions and get your chemical weed control guide from a friendly face, or you can download it online. It is available um, as a PDF online. And then the other thing that I want to plug, this has been... I guess I kind of call it my passion project. It's just been a lot of fun to start this podcast. And we were just talking about weed management. So, you know, we've had agronomists from North Dakota. We've had university weed scientists from Indiana. Um, we've just got a whole gamut of people that we've been visiting with about their research, their experiences, their field observations related to weed management. And, you know, how do we best utilize this 
um, well, I called it earlier this morning, the silver bullet. Uh oh, we've we might have uh, lost Sarah there. <laughs> she's definitely wow. first. are we back? She's back moving. Okay. <laughs> are we back? <laughs> yes, we can hear you okay. again. All right, that was a little unsettling. <laughs> so, all right, so just uh, War Against Weeds podcast, check it out. I think it. Craig's listened to some episodes. He can tell you offline what he really thinks. And with that, thanks guys. Um, you know, we'll take questions here as long as you folks are, are willing to stick around. And here's my contact information. You can email me. Um, you can get to me through your county or district agents. Um, follow me on social media. So thanks for your attention this morning. Thanks for logging in. I'm looking forward to visiting with you guys. All right, we do have some uh, questions that have came in, Sarah. Uh, what's your opinion of the 12 ounce verdict ahead of planting grain sorghum for pigweed control? So I've seen data that says that looks really good. Um, you know, we had verdict in our soybean systems and corn systems here um, last summer and it looks good. So um, Sharpen is a pretty good product when it's mixed with the outlook there in verdict. Gives you two modes of action. Um, and like I said, there's data, there was a multi-state study. It was Kansas and Colorado and I think Texas um, and looked at it ahead of grain sorghum and it looked good, especially for, in that case, it was for kosher control. All right, and here's a really good one. Uh, talking about success uh, with herbicides applied in heavy residue situation without adequate rainfall. So considerations to think about there, the residue is gonna tie up some of your herbicide. Um, you know, these are some things, some areas where we need more data in terms of how to best position these uh, particularly group 15 products to succeed. Um, more residue is gonna mean more, more herbicide tied up. Things you can do to get around that would be increase your application volume. I know when we think about freeze, we usually think about using a lower application volume just for you know efficiency standpoint, uh, but increasing that application volume can help to penetrate that, that residue and then get more of that herbicide where we want it. Okay, next one. Uh, what, what are your timing rec recommendations on a pre-herbicide and no-till Milo specifically going into corn uh, residue this year. Super specific. Is that the one here in the chat box? Nope. Uh, it's in the Q&A. Okay, I'll, let me flip over. That was pretty specific. I want to make sure I get all of yeah. that. <laughs> Pre-herbicide and no-till Milo. Um, so you're going to need, you know, you're going to have your burn down and then, you know, something with the planter right behind the planter is really what we're looking for, right? We want to take advantage of that pre-herbicide to give us that weed control from the time of planting until that crop is really competitive. So, you know, really, if we could do one thing to think about managing herbicide resistance and this idea of staying clean, it's that pre-herbicide going down with or right behind the planter. All right, we'll jump over to the chat if you, you see those two there. I see one about, is there a benefit to a specific group 15 is applied pre versus a group 15 applied post? I 100% have a student that's gonna get us some data on that. Um, you know, I hear folks talk about the benefits of maybe using acetochlor a little later in the season when rainfall is a little less likely because of that label statement that, um, that it does require a little less rainfall for activation. Um, but it, there are so many environmental factors that come into play there. Um, I think the big thing is just something um, is better than, than nothing. So maybe not the most satisfying answer to that. I'm sorry, Mike. The next question there, how effective a tool is, is a wick? Um, how much damage is already done by the time it gets high enough to wipe it on with the glyphosate? So you're asking the right question there in terms of you know, yield loss. For crops like corn and sorghum, a lot of that, that yield loss due to grassy weed competition is occurring early in the season. 
Um, and so by the time you get that height differential to successfully use a WIC applicator, you know, you're cleaning up the mess for next year. There's benefits to it, but as far as economic returns for the current year, um, that's less likely. Um, other things to think about, you know, the success of those WIC applicators depends on that good coverage and that good contact between the applicator and the, the weed. And so, you know, we often think about broadleaves as something that we go after with a WIC applicator, but, you know, Johnson grass and shatter cane have a little fatter leaf uh, for grass. They, they should have plenty of surface area there to, to get that accomplished. So, all right. A couple more came in. I'll let you look at the Q and A, uh, especially the one from Layton. All so right, Layton. Read it correct. Do you have an opinion on the best way to utilize Emiflex? So then the second part of that question is combining it with the group 15. A hundred percent, yes. Um, we've got treatments last summer where we looked at it combined with different um, group 15s and atrazine. And obviously from a, a weed management perspective, that's what we wanna do is go out with those effect, multiple effective modes of action. You're not gonna get much by the way of pigweeds out of Emiflex, okay? Um, in part because so much ALS resistance is around. Um, as I've looked at the data, so I've, I've seen that whole data set from um, the sorghum checkoff program last year. And really, if you're going after grass control with your Amiflex, which is what we should be targeting with, with that, that uh, product, really pre looks like a pretty good option there um, as far as getting greater control um, over other, other alternatives. Um, you know, Vipin's data there on the foxtail is, is not too different from some of the other data in that data set, uh, looking at, at using that product pre. So, will Emiflex control volunteer corn? Let's see, Amazomax, you'll get some activity, but really, you know, the best thing to do for volunteer corn is a ACCA's inhibiting herbicide select or a select alternative is, is gonna be a great answer for volunteer corn there. Oh, full-time, full-rate post. If I'm being perfectly honest, I haven't had a chance to look at that in Kansas in grain sorghum. So um, I'm not, not gonna, not gonna uh, do that. I'm sorry. Um, if, if Kurt were still here, he would probably be able to answer that one, no problem. But I'll do some digging. Who, who asked that question? I can do some digging and get back to your county agent. Uh, see there, who was that? That was Alan. Alan, if you want to send me an email, um, and then we'll get it passed along to Sarah. So we make sure to get your contact, get back to you directly on that. Um, I'll put my email in, again in the chat box and then just send me an email directly and we'll get it on to Sarah and go from there. Thank you for that, Jeannie. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Great question. I'm just not comfortable. Comfortable. Awesome. All right. Uh, if there's no other questions, we'll move on here. Uh, Chris, you still don't have any, do you? Nope. Still, I'm not seeing anything popping up from YouTube. All right. Well, uh, to close out, here's the QR code if you're needing. Uh, CCA credits, or if uh, you email Jeannie Falk Jones, uh, just another reminder uh, to also send her an email here uh, to check out at jfalkjones at ksu.edu. Then we also do have a, a little survey that will show up in the chat box uh, if everybody could uh, click on that and Fall, uh, fill out the evaluation just to give us a little feedback on how everybody liked this uh, virtual crop talk series and just to get some demographic uh, information for our reporting purposes. So like I said, that should be in the chat box. And uh, tomorrow we're actually having another one. Uh, this is a two-part grain sorghum series. Uh, tune in for the uh, 
to go over about insects in grain sorghum and control options. That'll be presented by Dr. J.P. Mashad, a KSU entomologist. Uh, starts the same time, 10.30 tomorrow, run to about 11.30. So, and I hope everybody enjoyed today's talk and can get out and enjoy the nice weather and get some work done. Craig, I do see in the chat box there that some folks were having some issues with the that previous Qualtrics link that was just posted. So I think Jeannie has gone ahead and posted the new one. Yes, sorry about that, guys. We had um, a little confusion on our evaluation. That um, second link that ends with the two capital W's, that is the link to take you to the evaluation. Sorry about that on the other, on the survey. We really do appreciate um, your feedback on that evaluation. It's not a real long evaluation. It's just really kind of getting a gut instinct of how the presentation went today, what you guys learned from it and asking about um, the webinar delivery and how well you like that, or if, um, we're trying to understand how we move forward with some of our programming in the future, how much is online and how much is in person. And so we really appreciate your feedback on that. There's a couple of questions on demographics. That's really just um, stuff that we need for our reporting side of things. So we really do uh, appreciate your guys' filling those evaluations out on everything. So, um, if you have any other questions or anything else for Sarah, you know, you may be driving down the road this afternoon and think, man, we should have asked Sarah another question. Um, feel free to email your county agent, email me, email Sarah, or give us a call. We're happy to get those passed along and see if we can get some um, good answers for you on this. Sorghum weed control is such a challenge. And, you know, as we start thinking about those post new technologies, you know, when I sit down and work on a sorghum budget, which I was doing yesterday, um, I always remember that those are kind of some of our rescue type of things to think through. And so starting clean is really the, the tactic for staying clean on that. So thank you, Sarah, for going through all of that. Thanks, Craig, for getting all of this facilitated with Sarah and getting us going on that. So, okay, I think if that survey link must be working because I'm not getting a lot of feedback on that. <laughs> Sorry about that guys for the wrong one. Okay, Craig, are we all finished up then? We should be. Okay, good. Thanks guys. And we'll see you tomorrow for Sorghum Insects.